I'm Doug, stand-up physicist, sitting down to give a whiteboard talk on quaternion series as a division algebra. Now, for those who are into math, uh, division algebra is a well-defined thing. You have to show that both addition and multiplication act as a group with whatever you're working with. A quaternion series? Well, that's not so well-known or defined, so let me define exactly what I mean by that phrase. It involves four ideas. The first is that you have a totally ordered array of quaternions. So all that means is that you've got this thing that starts like that and keeps on going where n, if you want to, is infinite. All right, boom. That's one thing. Second thing is you have an integer, which is number of rows. The third thing is an integer, which is the number of columns. And the final rule about this is that the rows times the columns has to equal the length of that totally ordered array. All right. Now you might say, hey, this sounds a lot like matrix algebra. And it is very, very similar to that with one important technical variation that I'll get to uh, when I try and do a division algebra. So if we have some names for some of these things. Um, so if the number of rows is one and the number of columns is one, then we'll call this quaternion series a scalar. And as a matter of fact, the scalar quaternion series behaves just like an actual quaternion except that it is always a different thing because a quaternion series always has this row and column information. But let's say the rows is just one and the columns is greater than one. Then what we're going to call that is a bra. And we're going to use this kind of symbol for it. And you say, hmm, where have I seen that kind of symbol before? probably quantum mechanics. And the whole reason for my investigation into quaternion series is this book, Quantum Mechanics, um, The Theoretical Minimum, What You Need to Know to Start Doing Physics by Susskind and Friedman. Because I'm going through the process of taking every math statement in this book and translating it into quaternion series. And I've gotten through three out of ten chapters, so that's progress. And, um, you yeah, know, so that's how it's going. So then they have the case where the number of rows uh, is greater than one, but the number of columns equals one, and we call that a ket. And we symbolize that like so. All right? And then there is the case where the number of rows is greater than one, and the number of columns is greater than one, and we call that an operator. All right, cool. So that is what a quaternion series is precisely. And I should say, I recently had to rewrite my, uh, my library for manipulating these things because the definition of a quaternion series was kind of it did not involve assigning the rows and columns to the data structure. And I realized eventually <laughs> that that was wrong. That a quaternion series, fundamentally, you must decide if it's a bra, in which case you can calculate by that fourth rule exactly uh, what the rows and the col columns are, or a ket, or something in between that uh, sort of thing. So, you know, doing com computer programming can help you make definitions more precise as you go along. 
All right, so now we're going to take those things and say, hey, do they behave like a division algebra? So to behave like a division algebra, you've got to say, okay, this quaternion series, quaternion series, and the plus operator, that acts like a group. And you must say that your quaternion series and the multiplication operator, actually, since that's used as a as a conjugation all over the place, I'm going to actually just use an X like that. Um, that that also behaves like a group. So what does a group behave like? <laughs> what, what does it take for a group? Four things again. All right. So the four things are that there is an identity, that there is an inverse, that there is closure, and finally, that it's associative. Great. And this is going to be super easy with addition. <laughs> So there's going to be like no issue at all uh, when you say, hey, is that true for um, for those those wonderful and wacky um, plus plus things? And it's like, yeah, super easy. Um, the multiplication, well, that's where things will get a little bit interesting. Uh, but I hope, hope to convince you that I've got a reasonable approach there. All right, so the identity for addition. All right, well, I, I like to make things concrete just because I'm an engineer type. Um, so we're going to start with a, a bra, one, two, three. And we say, well, what could I add to that that wouldn't change it at all? And so you say, oh, I bet the additive identity for that bra would be zero, zero, zero because the result of that, those two operations is one, two, three, that hasn't changed at all. Excellent, <laughs> okay? Now, again, as I was writing my library, um, I eventually saw that you really have to make sure that the description for this in terms of its rows and columns must be exactly the same as this one. Because otherwise, you could add a, a bra to a ket. No. No, you can't. <laughs> okay? And so you have to, like, enforce that by looking at the rows are equal to those rows, and that the columns of this one are equal to the columns of that one. And then you can say, okay, now you can go ahead and add and, um, and whatnot. So, so this, is, this is the additive uh, identity uh, for uh, a bra that has uh, a length of three, three columns. All right, great. So is there an inverse? And I bet you can guess this one pretty simply. Uh, you got your one, two, three, and you're gonna add it to minus one, minus two, minus three, and the result is zero, zero, zero. Ah, there we see that. So that's good. An inverse is always going to exist. Now. I am making things simpler here, okay? Uh, that That is a quaternion. One and two is also a quaternion. I could throw in all kinds of different values for the i, j's, and k's, uh, but if I want to give a quick video and just use this pen, it's much easier to just use those super simple uh, quaternions. All right, so is there closure? All right, so that would mean that if I had, in general, some a, where a could actually be like four or five states, who knows, um, and we add it, or I'll go a n to, to, to make it look a little bit more general. Um, and now I go with b n, and of course the n's have to be exactly the same. And then the, and then the result is going to be a, a n plus b n. So it's still the same kind of bra. You started with one bra of a certain uh, length and another bra of a certain length. And the result is uh, a bra of exactly that same length. So that's how we have closure. You don't kind of go wandering off. And now associative uh, means that we've got our, we don't care about the order in which we do these sorts of things. 
So if we've got A first adding on to B, and then the result equals, uh, and then we add on to, sorry, the a C, that that is going to be exactly equal to this AN if we do it after we add together BN yeah, plus CN. All right, cool. All right, so that's all well and good. And now we want to work on multiplication. And this is where people would say, nope, ain't gonna work. <laughs> By the rules of matrix multiplication, um, they are correct. It does not work. Why does not it not work? Okay, so if we had um, one, two, three, and we tried to multiply it by one, two, three, uh, then we say this has got one row and three columns, and we're trying to multiply it by something that has one row and three columns. And the reason that's illegal is because these two are not the same, all right? So we can never do that, and we're not breaking that rule at all, <laughs> okay? What, we're say what I do now, just the tiniest little bit of creativity, okay, is I say, if you have two quaternion series that are exactly identical like this in terms of their shape, and one of them has a one, okay, what we're going to do is we are going to diagonalize one of these guys so that we now, instead of having a 1, 3, 1, 3 situation, we have a 1, 3, 3, 3 situation, that that is what we mean when we say we're going to uh, form this product. So in this case, um, I would call this... Um, so that's that that remains illegal, okay? We haven't broken that. <laughs> what we're saying is we're when when po when in this situation we take our one, two, three, do nothing with it, but we diagonalize this one. All right. And now this is one three three. Three, okay, and the result of that—that's it—that's legal, okay. <laughs> um, that's totally legal, and you end up with with one, four, nine. Now, while it's legal, is it reasonable? Oh, will people disagree with me on this? Mm, well, let's hope not, um, but they might, uh, which is a certainly fine thing to do. Now, I'm going to say that's incredibly reasonable. Right? Because if I said, okay, I want to square this thing, then what I would do is I'd do an operator, I'd kind of map the squaring on that one. That's one way to do it. But what I'm saying is that is exactly the same as what I did here, which was one, two, three. And then I, I diagonalize one, two, three. And the result of that process is exactly the same thing. It's, yeah, I should say this 149 equals all this and all this sort of thing. So to me, that's a reasonable thing. I notice how I've changed how I refer to this. I, I'm not writing that. That's still illegal. <laughs> that remains illegal. Um, but what, or, I want, want the reader to know when they, they, they are the user of my software to know that when I say I want to multiply these two together, I am necessarily going to diagonalize the one over here, okay? A similar thing can be done with kets. Um, there, it's, it's, a, it's a three, one, three, one. So you have to diagonalize this ket here diagonalize a K um, and have it act 
on this this k and that is now a 3 3 3 3 3 1 and you'll notice that by having this rule in place the result is in fact a ket that's exactly the same size oh sorry so this ends up being k squared so i think that's a reasonable approach to take and it's very precise i mean i'm not being vague or anything i'm saying Whenever your, your conditions are, you've got a bra or you've got a cat and they're exactly the same size, then you diagonalize one of them. And then that's how, what I, that's what I mean by saying I've got, um, I'm going to be multiplying these two, uh, to these two together. All right. So hopefully that was clear. In, uh, in other words, I, I get to, since, since I'm developing my <laughs> my math, okay, I get to make my own rules. As long as my own rules are clear and kind of, in a certain sense, inflexible, um, then hopefully you'll let, let me uh, proceed. Okay, so now we want to know, is there an identity? All right, so if I start with a bra and I multiply by this identity, I end up with the same bra. All right, so now we go um, one, two, three, and then our diagonalized identity. Yeah. Equals, of course, one, two, three. So that means an identity uh, always exists. So that's good. How about inverses? All right, we'll go one, two, three. And since we're doing this by another thing that's supposed to be a bra, oh, a diagonalized bra, so it's really an operator, um, that would be one, one half. Ah, I keep on wanting to put a zero there. One third. And the result is one, one, one. Okay, well, that's pretty cool because there is the additive inverse we're so uh, familiar with, zero. And there is the multiplicative inverse that we're so familiar with, one. Three of them as a bra. Okay, so now do we have closure? And we do have closure because if we go a n times this diagonalized bn, are we going to end up with a, the right thing? I think so. We are going to end up with a n times b n. All right, so each and every one of them, it's going to multiply uh, the ones we kind of expect to. And you go, hold it, these these things are incredibly similar, right? Except that one's got a plus and that one's got a, uh, a multiplication. Okay? So that's why I think it works. And now, is it associative? Okay, so are we going to say that a n, first multiplying it by a diagonalized b n, that happens first, okay? resulting, of course, in a n times b n as a bra. Now we do that, as I say, first, and then we multiply that by a c n, which is diagonalized. Whoops, let me, let me put that in, because that's absolutely essential. Then, um, then, yeah, that should just equal, that should just equal a n times b n times c n. Great, great. But what about multiplying the diagonalized b n times the diagonalized c n? That will give you a diagonalized matrix. So that then times a will give you, in fact, in order, and order is really important for quaternions because uh, they don't commute. So uh, that will also end up with exactly that same result. Now, 
uh, it's pretty easy to convince yourself that all this logic should uh, carry over to cats, all right? Um, the question, an open question to me is, will that also carry over to matrix, uh, to, to operators? Um, because that gets a little bit more uh, complicated for the inverses. Uh, I'm not 100% sure on that. I'm going to say, I'm going to leave it open, okay? Because I don't want to pretend like I have uh, all the answers. I most certainly do not. Um, but I'm sure there's going to be identity um, for operators and there's going to be closure for operators and it's going to be associative. All that stuff is going to be uh, there. Inverting matrices is uh, is considerably more effort and stuff like that. So we'll, we'll leave that one open. But I hope you at least have a sense that maybe I, I can treat quaternion series as a division algebra. And that actually is going to have possibly <laughs> some, some impact to this study, right? Because everybody works with, uh, with uh, Hilbert spaces as vectors uh, algebras. And, you know, there, you know, the addition is a, a group operator, but they don't try and work with uh, multiplication like at all. And if you bring this fundamentally super important and powerful um, tool into the mix, uh, well, sometime I think it will have impact. I, I'm sorry, I can't say this is specifically the kind of extra thing you can have. But to be able to, to multiply to me and divide, okay, because I'm saying it really is, is a group thing going on. Um, to me, that's, why not be more why not be more powerful? <laughs> Alrighty, so thank you, and I hope you enjoyed this uh, little discussion about quaternion series as a division algebra. Thank you very much. A little epilogue. When I wrote an IPython notebook to manipulate quaternion series, I initially didn't have the rows and columns kind of be there as part of creating a quaternion series. And because of a critique I got from Purple Penguin, uh, uh, somebody on the internet, I decided that that was wrong, that it had to be kind of right there, right at the start. And I had to do a major reworking of my code, quite frankly, to make it more elegant and, and efficient. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the, the product uh, definition was crazy complicated. It was 144 lines. And after I got through with um, with the rewrite, it was down to like uh, 50 and change. It was a little over 50 uh, lines of code. And to me, that's a good thing. Now, part of it was dealing with this, oh, am I in a, in a situation where I need to diagonalize? And if so, just go ahead and do that and then proceed. Um, and so to me, that's an indication that we're, we're, we're improving uh, what we have. All right. Now, the second thing is that I'm going to actually have an IPython notebook available, a link below that shows all this, um, all these properties that show it really is a division algebra when I have something that's more complicated than one, two, three. All right. So thank you uh, again for listening this much.